let's do it. Let's get our Bibles, and we are in the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. I'm picking up after where um, uh, Derek left us off in verse 25. But let's pray. Father, I thank you for Ravi, how he's touched my life and so many lives. And Lord Jesus, that seed that multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. We spoke a while ago about that whole question of how many apples in a seed. Well, six, eight, ten. Think about it. I mean, how many seeds in an apple? Six, eight, or ten. But man, Lord, how many apples in a seed? And what he did in planting seeds all over the world. This is a man who I believe never knew what time zone he was in. And so, Lord, I thank you that he finally can have his rest. He can finally be in the presence of you. And Lord, with such joy and with such confidence that he continued all the way through till he heard the trumpet. Lord, may we today hear and receive an honor. A man who literally gave his life to teach the word. As we honor this weekend those who have given their lives that I can stand here and preach the word. And that we can also stand up for the freedom to be able to teach the word of God in the public house. Thank you, Lord, for these sacrifices that have been made. And so now, Lord, may we honor them with our hearts and our minds that we would now glean, Lord. We don't need to hear another sermon. We need to be transformed, Lord. We need to have this empower us. And so for that to happen, it takes a miracle of God. And so may I now decrease and all of us decrease and the word of God, your Holy Spirit, increase in us that we would be transformed to be more like you so we can lead more people to you. In your name I pray, amen. All right, take your Bibles with me today, and we are in Mark chapter 4. Now remember, Derek left us off at verse 25, so let's start there. He said this, For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. And we've spoken about the fact that when you see that verse, it sounds like another one of those abrasive Bible verses that people can get all upset about. It's like, wait a minute, whoever has, they're going to get more, but the one that doesn't have, even what they have, they're going to take that away? What is that about? That doesn't sound fair. Well, one of the things I always love to say is if you want fair, Go to Satan because he's fair. He will always give you what you deserve. God is not fair. He gives us grace. Amen? He gives me more than I deserve. So I know I got a God who died on a cross for my sin, so he would hold nothing back. So then what is he saying? What it's speaking about, remember, Derek is making it very clear, the mystery, that musterion of the revealed word. So what he was saying is that when the word of God is revealed, the person who has, they will even begin to get more. When they take what God has given and they don't just hear it, but they respond to it, they let it go deep and germinate within their lives, then more and more and more. But the one who doesn't have, they didn't respond to God's word will and way. They heard it, maybe had an emotional response, kind of raised their hand at church, but never made any other steps towards what God's promises and his callings and obedience to it. Then what happened? happens is what they have, it's going to be taken away. Meaning, not from somebody else. God's not going to come take it away. It's that the things of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, boastful pride of life are going to completely crouch it out. And remember, we're in the context of the same chapter of the worries choking it out, all the different things of the four soil. So that is what he's explaining is, is that when we get this seed, what we do with it will really have eternal consequences. And that's why it's very, very important. And I loved how the fact that he used that illustration of the sponge. Purpose of a sponge is to soak up. But don't forget what you saw Pastor Derek doing. When he put the sponge in, he soaked everything up, then he brought it to the other one. Then what did he have to do? What did he have to do? He had to wring it out. He had to squeeze it in order so that when he put the sponge back in, it was ready to suck up some more. Family, people are always going, God, why are you wringing me out? Because he needs you to come back. Man, if you are a person that goes to church and you're listening to the radio, you know, in the car, and oh, I don't get it. I used to really like this Christian station, but it's just kind of old to me now. And I'm reading the Bible and it's not really exciting anymore. Hello, full of water. You have not allowed the holy hands to take you from where you were to glean all of the word and the seed and then to be wrung out in the community and the people around. Let God do that twisting that we go, but then it makes us all the more hungry and thirsty for God's word, for worship, for fellowship and evangelism. Amen? 
So that is where he's putting us all in there. Now, last thing I got to say is I got to pick on Pastor Derek, and that is the fact that when he got to verse 21, I have here in my notes, Derek the newbie. So all of you home group leaders, you'll see this. When he got to verse 21, this is the verse, it says, and he was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put in under a peck measure, a really bad word in the New American Standard. Most of us know it from the King James word, but puts it under a what? A bushel, excuse me, doesn't put it under a bushel or under a bed. It is not brought to be put on a lampstand. And you see what the thing is? That when Derek came here, I had already had somebody else closing the service. But most of you guys that have been around at least five years at One Love Ministries know that for literally for over 30 years, I ended every single sermon up on the stage saying, are you going to take this truth and hide it under a bushel? And the whole crowd would yell, no. no. Yes, exactly. And so that would, I was hoping that we would see that and go, yeah, this is our one love. But yeah, it's part of allowing everyone else to be a part of the ministry and doing stuff. But that's where I get that life verse when I say, are we going to take this truth and hide it under a bushel? All right. So now here we are today at chapter four. Let's start at verse 26 now and begin to see what God has for. I'm going to read from 26 to 29. And he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the ground and who goes to bed at night and gets up by day and the seed sprouts up and grows. How? He himself does not know. The earth produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, and the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits... He immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now again, we're still in the same chapter. He's speaking in this farm illustration regarding the seed. But now this one is kind of using the same elements, but in a very different way. So let's pay attention to that, what we see here. First of all, recognize what Jesus is doing. I love the fact that he is amongst a rural people. So he's using rural illustrations. You'll notice that, especially if you go in Israel with me, we start reading things. You'll see when he's in the fishing area, he uses fishing illustrations. And when he's in the rural farming area, he's using farming illustrations and where they're doing cropping and with animals and such. God always brought the message in a relative way to the people who were around him. He spoke of things that they understood. Hear that, evangelist. You use the things, the terminology of the people around you that they would understand. And so when he would speak in a parable, he would first start with, that which was understood identifiable and draw those things to Christ. You're doing no one a favor to have taken one year of Bible college or had a read, read a commentary and you start speaking the things of God with such wisdom. It doesn't matter what you know. It matters does this person understand Jesus lives, Jesus loves, and Jesus saves. A sower goes out to so, and so we need to understand what he was doing and he was seeing there. But what we see in this very first parable we see similar things today in the second parable, and that is this. We see a process, jot that down. We see a process of things that are happening, listen, that are related to the seed. So these things happen related to the seed. First of all, sowing. The same as we saw, the second one we have then is growing. And right after we have them growing, we have harvesting. And in this area of harvesting, the emphasis in this story is going to be on the growing phase. So we got sowing, growing, and harvesting. So remember, a sower goes out to sow, but now he makes a shift. Why? Well, look at verse 26 and we'll understand why. He says this, and he was saying, what does it say? The kingdom of God is like. I encourage you in your own Bibles to first of all just circle that. Is like. The kingdom of God is like. Important to grasp that. I'll tell you why in a moment. It's like a man who cast seed upon the soil. Now remember family, this whole passage, this whole passage begins with a sower and the seed and Jesus explaining it. Now remember as Derek said, it's about now the mystery being revealed. It's not a mystery the way we think of mystery that we don't know. No, it's something that we could not know before and now we get it. I don't know if you've ever guys gone to those... Um, uh, what do they call those locker rooms where they lock you in? You have to have all the clues and stuff like that. What are they called? Escape, Escape rooms. Yeah, and then all of a sudden somebody figures it out and you all go, yay! That's it. It's the yay moment. Musterion. When all of a sudden you recognize, here it is, boom, 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 and we've got this thing and we can actually get out of here and get ice cream. So it's like, wow, here it is. And so that's what he's explaining about. But here, put this in your notes. 
The first parable, what's different is the first parable was about the seed itself. The seed itself and what impact it has. Remember, on the road, around the, the rocks, Okay, around the thorn and thistles, and then on the good soil. So it's the seed itself and what impact it has. But now pay attention with me. In this parable, in his same speaking, this one is about the seed, but it shifts to the kingdom of God. And he speaks about the seed as the source. So this parable is about the kingdom of God. And he shows the seed as the source. Here's your great epiphany from the very beginning. What is the seed? What did Jesus say the seed was? It was the word, right? So the seed, Jesus tells us, is the word of God. That's how he explained the parable just moments ago to the disciples. Now, let's go to John 1. What is the word? Well, a better way of saying it is, who is the word? Jesus. So we got the kingdom of God, and it's now the seed, but the seed is the source of the kingdom of God. Who is the seed? Jesus, the Word. Now remember, from the very beginning, Mark said this in chapter 1, verse 14, and after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching, there it is, the gospel of God, which he's talking about, the spreading of the seed, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom, what does it say, church? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And if you look back on your notes, then I taught you that the kingdom of God, as we see through the gospels, is a person, place, and thing. So we have that now. We have very much Jesus, the person, that place that we will be able to go to, and the thing, that essence, that presence, that I'm in the kingdom of God now because I am God's child. And so we begin to see here, the kingdom of God here is like And so he begins to give us the description. It says this, The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil and goes to bed at night, pay attention to that, and gets up by day. And the seed sprouts up and grows. How? He himself does not know. Did you catch that very, very important main and powerful point? Look at there in the text. Again, We are talking about what? Help me out. The kingdom of God. And what the kingdom of God can be compared to. The kingdom of God is like. So he's teaching us about something that can be compared to. Notice, a sower. What does the sower do? It says, it's like a man who goes out and he casts the seed upon the soil. So he casts the seed upon the soil. Then what? Then what does he do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What does the Bible say? He cast the seed and then what? Baga take one nap. Kanak attack. Boom. He is flat on his back, belly up. He says here, he says, and he goes to bed at night. Folks, notice with me here. This is so important. This is a description, jot this down, of power. Very clearly. Source and impotence. Yes. And we're going to explain that. But what is the power that makes this thing miracle happen? What is the source that makes this miracle happen? And what isn't the source of making this miracle happen? I think some of you are tracking with me here. You see, sadly, because those in Christendom, the church and all of us, we have not gotten this clear. And sadly, it has been confused so many times that it has brought so much hurt and confusion and pain through the ages. So look with me at verse 27 again. How do we understand what God is saying about power, source, and impotence? It says, the sower casts the seed on the soil then and goes to bed at night. What would going to bed at night kind of signify? Why do you go to bed at night? Yeah, sleep to get some To get some rest. Oh, are we weary? As the song goes, Christian. You see, it's your Christian life. Oh, it's so hard, Pastor, being a Christian. I struggle in it. Here, it's interesting here. It says the kingdom of God. It's like someone who casts the seed. But then, what does the sower do? The sower, come on, Hawaiian. Moi, moi. The bugger gonna knock out. He goes sleep. 
And he gets up by day and check it out, check it out, he walks outside and what happened? The seed sprouts up and grows. And I love it, it's right there in the Bible. How? He don't know. How? I don't even know how it happened. See, jot this down, make it clear. The sower is not the source of the miracle of growth. Let me say it again. The sower is not the source of the miracle of growth. Oh, how come God doesn't do miracles anymore? Beloved, he is doing miracles all day, every day, all around us. Those who have, more will be given. As you begin to open your eyes to God's word and his action, you begin to see his hand and more and more each day you see the revelation of God and you're just in amaze of what he's doing and you're just so stoked. Those who don't have, even what they did have as far as alertness to God, just gets lost in all the busyness, getting choked by the things of this world. You see, listen, they not only are not the source, I love this in the Bible, but they don't even know how it happened. I go to sleep, wake up, boom. And they took this seed. Now, this is important. Let me put it in a reference for us. There is a very common phrase today in Christian circles, and it's called church planting. Okay, it's when there is not a church and someone goes out in faith, believing that God has called them to start this church. And so they do whatever means and so on and so forth. And when that church is birth and it begins, it's called planting a church. Since that is what Cindy and I have done, Several times, we would be called church planters. But folks, this is where the danger happens. When we do not realize power, source, and impotence. Let me give us the understanding and the warning that we need. First of all, Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? See, Paul was saying to this church that they came when the Spirit of God fell, when they heard the word, the seed was implanted in their hearts. And now, all of a sudden, they're trying to do this program and this thing. It says, are you so foolish? Are you now trying to be perfected by a program, by a lunch, by a this thing, by an ex whatever it is, some kind of class that we need to do or some kind of banners that we need to have, some kind of glossy brochures. He's saying, are you so foolish that you think now what's going to bring the increase is what you do? Because in this story, a sower casts the seed, baga goi moi moi, and he wakes up and God has brought the increase. Amen. Second, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they it labor in vain who build it. Now, I have this verse printed out all over my house. Most of you know, Cindy and I are in the middle of a total reno of a, of a house that was like 73 and rotting to death. But I just printed it out like 20 times and went around the house and started putting it in different places. In fact, I was even taking down a wall yesterday that had it on there um, or a couple days ago. And I was trying to take it off carefully. Like Cindy's like, you can print another one. I'm like, oh yeah, okay. But we want to be reminded that it's the Lord, whether it's a physical house or it's this house, unless the Lord is doing the work we're laboring in vain. Amen? See, when you understand the source and the power and who isn't the power. But if you want to get busy, God will let you get busy. If you want to come up with all these different types of programs and things for your home group or for your Bible study and all of this energy that you want to spend to make your ministry fly and all these different things, well, guess what? You can do so. But you know what? Jesus told another parable about two different people who built a house. One on sand, one on a rock. And if you notice when he talks about the house on the sand, it says the wind came and the, and the rain came and the house fell and it says this, and great was its fall. That means they were able to put together something that was impressive. Oh, you might be able to build a program, you might be able to build a church, but its ability to last its longevity and its authenticity is what's going to be in question. There was no credibility to that house. And when trials came, that house fell. And that's the question that you and I have to ask ourselves today. You see, what we understand here, what the Bible is saying, is when human beings begin to intervene in God's work, things get messy. Come on, can I get an amen? Man. Man, think about it in your life. How many times God was doing something, you're like, hey, great, I got it. Let me take it from here. 
He brings that person you've been praying for and you gather together and you start dating and it's great and you're praying before and then all of a sudden the focus and then instead of being about God with you, it's about just each other. And you did a whole date without praying and you did this and then maybe you missed a weekend because you went to the big island together with each other and all these other different things and all of a sudden, what happened? When human beings begin to intervene in God's work, things get messy. We need to be reminded that it's all about Jesus. My favorite part when it comes to seeing the success of this church, the church on Molokai, the church in Santa Barbara, these places where Cindy and I have been privileged to cast the seed and watch what God does, people would come and say, wow, this is very blessed. Blessed work, this is great. People walk down here in this sanctuary and they're like, wow. And they just keep walking back and going, wow, wow, wow. When they see all the wonderful things that God has blessed us with. And all I tell them is the same thing in John. When they fished all night in their own program, they got what? Nothing. Okay, I get one kanak in the house right now. Nothing. And all of a sudden Jesus says, you know what? Troll them on the other side. And as soon as they did, the nets were full, but I said choke. <laughs> the nets were full, and you know what the first thing that Peter, excuse me, John said to Peter? It's the Lord. It's the Lord. Do you wake up and say, it's the Lord? Do you walk out to your car? It's the Lord. You look at the spouse that you've been struggling with and having all kinds of issues with, but you don't realize how many people have been praying their entire life or wishing and wanting and never had that person to love or even had a moment of happiness. It's the Lord. You see, it's not the sower. The sower is not the source. It's the work of God. And so God says rest. Even when it came to creating Eve, hey, Adam, take a nap. And he created the partner that he says, this is bone in my bone, flesh in my flesh. Are some of you even striving without rest in this area in your life as well? See, notice how we want, God wants us to know that it's not us. Verse 28, huh, nails it again. The soil produces crops. What does it say? By itself. Go ahead and circle that in your Bible. The soil produces the crop, meaning he wakes up. I don't know how it happened. And then Jesus tells us, the soil produces the crop by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. Now, first of all, that word by itself that I had you circle, you'll get a kick out of this. It's the Greek word automate. Guess what word that comes? We get from that. Automatic. Hawaiian, how many times? Oh, bro, automatic. Automatic. Atomate. Now you can, when they say it, you can go, oh no, Greek, but atomate. <laughs> but here's the thing. Check it out. What atomate is, look at it, I have it overhead because it's so important. Without visible cause. Meaning, it's implying without human assistance, which is then meaning it's referring to a work done by whom? God. A work done by God. And so this very reference is saying, listen, this is not a thing of man. It's a work done by God. And all of a sudden we begin to understand something that is so powerful. God is the one who is at work. And it's not us. Now, right now, Cindy and I, as we're reading this year, through the Bible, straight through from Genesis to Revelation, rather than doing the one that has a New Testament, Old Testament uh, reading and such. So we're going all the way through. And I got to tell you, most of you know, especially if you were here when we were doing the Wednesday night Bible studies, I just love OT. I light up in the OT. I, the Old Testament just is so relevant and it helps me understand Jesus and what he's done in my life and why so much more. But one of the things that's really been standing out to me as we've been reading through the Old Testament is how many times God has literally wiped out an entire army overnight. And so here's this huge army. And so the whole Assyrians will come and everyone's like, oh, and then and the people of Israel finally say, oh God, we're sinners, forgive us. And they fall on their knees and pray. And then they come out with all their swords and shields and they come up and every single one of the enemy is dead. And that wasn't just a onesie. I think all the time. They would get some kind of fright, fight each other, whatever it is that... God fought their battles. Come on, amen? So now all of a sudden they begin to start standing something. It's not about us. Think about Joshua chapter 6. Let's walk around a wall. 
and let's blow trumpets. I think God wanted them to know that it wasn't them. It wasn't the breath of the shofar. It was God knocking down walls. Did you hear me? Because that's for somebody. Well, we let God do what he does. Now, he told them to walk humbly. He told them to march around it. Are you? He told them to simply trust and to blow the shofar. Are you? What has God already asked you to do so he can tear down the walls that have been gripping you in heart, heartache, pain, whatever it may be? Think about Peter's jailbreak. We saw that in the book of Acts. He's got people inside praying, oh Lord, let Peter come out. Peter's inside, oh Lord, I don't want to be an angel comes, boom, lets him go. Is this for real? He takes him all the way through, still thinks it's a dream. And then when he gets outside, he wakes up, goes, wow, Joe break. I'm out. And he goes to the very house praying for him. And you know the story. Rhoda says, hey, Peter's at the door. Like, come on, come back here and pray for Peter. <laughs> Folks, are you seeing the mighty hand of God? The kingdom of heaven is like. Are you in the kingdom of heaven? The person, the place, and the thing, that presence, that peace, that assurance. It's like a sower who casts the seed and then steps back, rest, and watches the miracles happen. Some of us have been praying and then got tired of praying and started planning. You see, the soil produced the crop by itself. I want you to jot this down. All we can do is sow. God alone brings the increase. I'll say it again. If you can hear anything in this message today, all we can do is sow. It's God and God alone who brings the increase. One of the things that Pastor Chuck used to teach us all the time If it's up to you to obtain, then it's up to you to maintain. I don't want that. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul put it this way. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is what? Anything. Okay, that's a little humbling. Is anything but God who causes the growth. Okay, now. Eyes this way again, please. So that means, yeah, they need help to have the eyes back this way. Okay, here we go. That means should God call me home tomorrow? Whatever is happening at one love, it's not the sower. It's the presence of God and the seed. It is our focus on the teaching of the word of God. That has done what it's done here in Kaka'ako, what it's done through all the wonderful plants and all the things that are happening, those watching literally around the world right now. It's the word of God. God says, I will honor my word. Amen? And so, so God call me to whatever, retire or move or go someplace else. You got to learn something. Waxer Tipton has never been the pastor of this church. And the day that I become that, it would be a scary thing. God is your shepherd. The Holy Spirit is our preacher. It is his word. And so whether it's Derek, whether it's Myola, Duke, myself, we're sitting here and we're just throwing seed. And whether you thought it was a bummer of a sermon or whatever, well, that tells us what kind of soil you are. Not the word. The sower cast, and then he steps back and lets God, God. But so many think it's about programs. So many. In fact, I did something just curious this week. I googled Church growth book. Take a look at that. Bam! And I could have just kept scrolling. Scrolling for pages and pages. I just took one snapshot of all of these books written on how to grow your church. Well, guess what? The first week of this church, we would still be in compliance of the COVID-19 gatherings. Five or six of us. The Lord is the giver of increase. If it's up to you to obtain, it's up to you to maintain. Let God bring 
whether it's a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a plan, a business, whatever it is, let God, God, because God is not his name, help me out, but his job description. Hallelujah, amen. All right, now, keep in mind here, it's very important we connect what Pastor Derek was teaching in the mix between what I said and the soils. God has been speaking about the mystery of the effect of the seed. So, talking about the four different soils, talks about the ground, but when the ground is right, there is this miracle that happens. And so, context, family. Jesus is speaking about the mystery of the effect of the seed. Now, this is why I'm saying this, because it's absolutely unexplainable I can't tell you how, and you can't tell to others, how studying the scriptures of God causes the kingdom of God to be established within us and among us. It's true. People all the time, oh, you know, man, I'm having this and I'm having that time and I'm really going through this and I'm really, hey, tell me about your quiet time. Well, you know, I've been really kind of lately, da, 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 da. Seven days without Jesus makes one Week. W E A K. You see, the word. And so here's this thing the kingdom of God, that presence of his peace and power and his promise and future and hope, and that he will provide, and that you'll know that God's got this. That kingdom of God, being a citizen of the king, and in his kingdom, where his kuleana is to care for his citizens, it's like someone who casts seed. A sower goes out to sow. They're walking in obedience. But then they don't try to manipulate. They don't try to direct God in their prayer life. God, this is what I need and this is how I need you to do it. It's a heart that truly just says, Abba, Father, this is what I think. This is what I feel. This is what I desire. And if it is of you, grant it. If not, change my heart. Show me. But Father, your will be done. I want to watch you work. I don't want to block your miracles. See, John Corson put it this way, and I really love that he says, when we study the word corporately and have devotions personally, something happens miraculously. Isn't that good? When we study the word of God corporately, like we are right now, and when we have devotions personally, something happens miraculously. Are you having miracles? Are you seeing them? And thus you're just dancing in the streets with delight because you're seeing the hand of God. Now, after he explains what happens without the inter in intervention of man, then notice what it says in verse 29. It says this, but when the crop permits, okay, so the soil, automatic, brings it on up because it's the hand of God who put all the nutrients in the soil. God is at work. But when, big circle there, the crop permits, he immediately puts the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, church, this very first parable we looked at was about the miracle of evangelism. It's a picture of evangelism. A sower goes out to sow. But this one, so it's clear, it's about the focus of the coming of God's kingdom by the mysterious sovereign work of God. Now, leave that there for a second, Carly, so they can see it. This parable's focus is about the coming of God's kingdom, but it's coming, how? By the mysterious, sovereign work of God. That's where the awe comes in. The emphasis is on the growth by God's hand, by the Holy Spirit empowered in and of and through his people, a church that's submitting and surrendered unto him. See, that's what this parable is saying. This is your work, God. And when it says, when the crop permits, I believe he's referencing right there to the time. So he's saying we're going to be sowing the seeds, the kingdom of God here on earth. But it says, but when the time permits, that's the time. Mark will tell us later in Mark 13, 33, but it says, take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when, and what does it say, church? The appointed time is. Family, we're going to learn more about that in the parables. But if you've been any Bible student of all, we know that there's a day in the hour when God will bring forth his sickle to the earth and he will separate the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares. And so he's saying, God's going to do his work, his word, his will, and his until the time that he knows that it's time to call us home. Now find me at verse 30. It says this, And he said, Jesus, 
How shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present it? It's like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the soil, though it's smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, grows up and becomes larger than all of the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. Now, this is one of those passages where I just crack up. Because if you've ever studied this or any of the other ones in the synoptics next to it, you will find that there are lines by lines, pages by pages of commentaries of people arguing about this passage. This simple little illustration, parable, meaning story, big story, a small story to tell a big point. They argue over this. And you know why? They talk about the size. Well, I don't know whether there's a mustard seed. No mustard seed is big enough for the plant. Don't you see what the size of mustard seeds are? So what Jesus is saying is that it's going to be a non-natural growth. Or it's going to be this. And it's like, oh my gosh. What did I say? When human beings intervene, what happens? It gets messy. Some of you are going to have little Bibles that have little annotations on the bottom. It's saying, well, the mustard seed plant actually doesn't, you know, and all this kinds of nonsense. Hello. Folks. Stick to the text. Man, I had a seminary professor who would yell that at us. We'd be like, well, could it be? Did go, Stick to the text. <laughs> That's why I have context plus content equals meaning because I was going. <laughs> context plus content equals meaning. He's telling a story to bring a point. What is the point? That the miracle of growth is not manipulated by human effort. Do you agree? Amen. So he's talking about this miracle of growth, not what humans do. You cast, you rest, there's going to be a time to sickle. Now notice, he says this, it's going to grow in this miraculous way. But then the next thing he says is this, they also argue about the last part, so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. So now many want to make a connection, and some of your Bibles might have those little notes. Remember, by the way, the top half of your Bible is the Bible, that's the word of God, and this part is the word of a commentator. This is good. This, eh. Understand that. But then they'll begin to talk about well, the birds of the air. Well, look at verse 15 when Jesus was saying, and are, these are the ones, the seed that falls beside the road, and the word is sown, and when they hear it, immediately Satan comes. It said the birds come and eat it. So Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown. So what they are saying is, is that as the church would grow, then this kingdom of heaven, this earthly connection, the church, as it would grow, then evil would find its way and the birds of the air would find its way into its branches and such. Well, folks, yeah, church history has shown that. So as someone is so that say that this is the point and look, because we see what happened when the church became organized, organized excuse me, after Constantine and all these different stuffs and all of the horrible black eye that we have in Christendom when humanity has gotten in the way and made things messy. And so that's what many want to go to. Stick to the text. He's talking to a bunch of farmers about the miracle of growth. And I strongly believe what he was simply saying in a simple parable is this. Jesus was saying what was once seemingly so insignificant. There wasn't a single farmer there that would not know what this seed is. Go ahead and go to that seed first and then I'll go back to the flower. No, go ahead and show me the, the seed. That's one of the mustard seeds. I passed them out many times here in the church. I always have a baggie of them because it's not hard to have a baggie of them. And I pulled that little pin out out of my desk so that you could see this tiny, teeny, weeny little seed. Now go to that next picture with the flowers. And so now here we see the mustard. So look at this incredible, how could something so teeny weeny weeny create something that would grow into a way that is 10 gazillion times bigger than it? Are you tracking with me? And then I say, it's mustard tree. There is no tree. It's just a tiny little bush. Stop it already. Mm. <laughs> Folks, even in that, there is actually a tree a mustard tree, if you've ever gone on summer trips with me, you have seen this. I've shown you this. It's the Synaptus Nagara. That's the picture that is taken there. That picture is taken in the summertime. So if you've ever done the sweaty Israel trip with me, you've had the privilege of seeing that flat. Now that seems to me like a bird can sit in it. You know what I'm saying? I've seen them there. Took picture. 
Look, crick, crick. Ha, oh, tourists, ha, oh, take crick, shot, crick, crick. It's the birds. Folks, look at the text. It's saying that something that was once seen as so seemingly insignificant miraculously becomes a place of shade and rest. Come on, tell me, does that not preach? This Jesus guy, what does that have to do with me? This Bible, this what once seemed to be so seemingly insignificant to you has now grown in your heart and mind. And it's become a place of shade and rest. That's what Jesus is saying. I believe in all my heart. If you're the good soil, if you want to cast out the stones, if you want to stop trying to manipulate God's hand in your life and let God, God, what seemed to be like, oh, how could that actually change my marriage? Or there's a, mm-hmm. What seemed so insignificant can bring shade. Some of you are just getting burned right now. And I didn't mean that as a ba bump I made it as a literally, think about it. You're getting burned by all kinds of things. You don't have the shade of the word of God. And you're not resting. You're not taking that nap and trusting in the Lord and leaning not on your own understanding. You're still getting up thinking, I gotta provide for my kids. How, what are we gonna do now with this whole COVID thing? And what about with a job? And if I have this and all of a sudden and all this stress and the worries and the fears of the world just choking out the comfort of shade and rest. And you know, in Hawaii, we know, we know shade's a good thing. Jesus himself said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The seemingly insignificant seed has become the truth that has set you free. It's the truth that set you free. That's what he's speaking about. Now, will you let God continue being God? Or are we going to be the foolish Galatians? For here in verse 33, it says this. And with such many parables, he was speaking the word to them. And they were, excuse me, as they were able to hear it. Underline that, please. It says this. And with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them. And please get this. As they were able to hear it. I've been talking about that this whole time, the miracle of growth, but the context and where it is. Verse 34, and he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. And this is where we end today on this verse. So let's look at this right here. It says this, we were recently just reminded that Jesus' style was to speak in parables. Do you remember why? He chose to speak in parables. Why? Because he could adapt it to the environment of where he was and to the level of their understanding. Did you get that? Our Jesus spoke in parables, but what is he doing? So he could bring it to the things they would know, fishermen with fishermen, farming with farming. With the scribes and the Pharisees, he would talk about the things in there. Academics towards the academics, farmer with the farmers. This is what I love it. Because he would direct it to the level of understanding of those who are around. Why am I making such a big point again in the same sermon? Because nothing has changed. God will still speak your language. Oh, I can't read the Bible. I don't understand it, beloved. Take the Bible again. Hold it in your hand and say, Jesus, if this is your word and your love letter to me, help me understand. Jesus speaks your language. He knows your pain. He knows your hurt. He knows your fear. He knows what level you are at. Oh, I'm not a seminarian. Yeah. <laughs> Neither was 90% of the people in the Bible God came and spoke to. Folks, he will do that. He will speak to your level. But what was the main point of parables? I'll tell you that. The main point was to sift the hearts that are truly seeking. Seek and we will what? Fine. The people that were looking for a free lunch, they heard a story. Huh? So he spoke in parables. So that those who are truly wanting to discover the miracle of growth of God's word, they would find it. That God's promise. But it ends here when he says, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. You ever read that and kind of gone again? Why, why did they get that special treatment? 
he would go and explain. I thought everyone else had to go seek it. Why, why were they getting this special treatment that he was explaining? I'll tell you the answer why. We're reading the answer why. It was these very disciples that God was going to use to pen the scriptures. I think he wanted to make sure they got it straight. Okay? And that have commentaries are going, well, I think the birds mean. He's putting this, he's explaining this, that they didn't even know then what God was going to do later in their life. Come on, can I get an amen on that? God was doing a work in their life so that later when they would have the revelation by the Holy Spirit, they would remember these things that Jesus taught them. And you know what? This is the verse when it says that he was explaining to them privately. This is the verse that completely explains the amazement that the Pharisees always had with the disciples. Do you remember that in the book of Acts? Look here in Acts 4, verse 13. And as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood they were, quote, uneducated and, quote, untrained men, they were marveling and beginning to recognize them as having been with Jesus. <laughs> Folks, untrained and uneducated? Are you kidding me? Can you imagine being a graduate of Jesus Christ Seminary? Where'd you go to school, JC? Yeah, I got my three-year degree at JC. We would be like, wow, how incredible would that be? Well, guess what, family? In a way, all of you can. All of us can. What does it say? He was explaining to his own disciples. So the question is, are you one? Maybe God's not going to reveal another thing to you until you actually take a step with what he revealed last to you. Maybe it's time to stop hiding behind the questions that you don't have answers to and start being honest with the answers you've already been given. And God says, come to me. Surrender. Let me do it. Stop manipulating and making a mess of your life. Beloved, are you his disciple? John 14, 25, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will, not Pastor Derek, not Pastor Waxer, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Oh my goodness, if we are his disciple, then the Holy Spirit comes in when we recognize the Holy Spirit in us, with us, and upon us, and once baptized in the Holy Spirit, God brings that, that word to our lives, that rhema word, Word, that epiphany that jumps off and all of a sudden you understand what he's saying in a way that you never saw it before. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. He says, and you, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves for a slave doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for, check this out, all things that I have heard from my father. What does he say? I have made known to you. Oh, JC Seminary is open. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. A sower goes out to sow. The kingdom of heaven is like a sower who casts the seed and take a nap. Trust in the Lord. And then he says this, and that your fruit would remain, that whatever you ask, of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Verse 17, this I command you that you what? Love one another. Okay, eyes this way. Interesting. I don't know how God's got me. I don't understand the word of God. But when you go to church, well, you know, when I go to church, there's a lot of hypocrites there. Oh, well, this church does this. You know, when these people, well, they do topical sermons. They don't do it like we do, line by line. See, you want to flunk out of J.C. Seminary? Don't love. Because the entrance exam is, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now love in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and delivered himself up for my sin. Wow. See, one's churchianity, the other is Christianity. Where are you? Are you building a mighty thing that's just going to fall when the winds come? 
We've got a storm going on right now in our world, don't we? An economic storm. Where are you at? You see, my ending thoughts for us today is this. All we can do is sow the seed. It's all we can do. It's God who does the miracles. Amen? So stop trying. Let God be the miracle worker. When we study the word corporately and have devotions personally, something happens miraculously. And folks, when you and I can get what he was saying for us here today, and that is this, when we understand the distinction between power, source, and impotence, it is God's power. The word of God is the source, and I don't bring it. My impotence, I have nothing, Paul said. Wow. And when we step back and let God, God, oh, the freedom, family, oh, the freedom that comes like in this whole situation that we're in right now. Yeah, starting to open up businesses. Churches are starting to open up. That doesn't mean everyone's bank account just is gonna go back to normal. And it means everyone's job is gonna come back to normal. Family, in this beautiful refining time, are you gonna watch miracles happen? Or are you gonna manipulate a mess? Be without rest, stress, then angry at God and angry at the church and all the other things around? Or are you going to let God love you? Are you going to trust and obey? For there's no other way to be happy than to trust and obey. A song I learned in preschool. Folks, this is what it's about. And listen, we're, we're in the same boat. If you're not getting a check, then, then you're not tithing. And then if you're not tithing, then, well, the churches in Hawaii are not going to be able to exist and to pay their rent and keep it existing and all these other different, all of this stuff could go. So, I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous begging for bread. Those are David's words. So I'm going to trust the word of God. God's large and. So family, this is it. If you are fret, fretting and stressing Understand that God is the one that does the work. Maybe you just need to simply add the serenity prayer to your prayer life to get you focused on rest and let God do what God does. It simply says this, God, grant me the serenity, key word, to accept the things I cannot change. Folks, we cannot change the past. We cannot change what others think and feel. And God, give me the courage to change the things that I can. Well, I can change the present and I can change what I think and feel when I step back and let God have his way. And then, Lord, give me the wisdom to know the difference. Oh, you see, God, they're asking for serenity and that comes when we walk in the obedience to step back and not get in God's way. And here's the best part. I just, when I was typing this out and I saw serenity, I went on, huh, and I went down to synonyms and I went click. The synonyms to serenity is, and it's up there for you to see, tranquility, calmness, peacefulness, quietness, composure, I love this, coolness, and poise. Just leave that list there for a second. Is that you right now, Christian? If it's not you, then two questions. Are you walking according to God's word, will, and way? Or are you messing things up? Or number two, are you yet his disciple? I'm not asking if you know and agree with me. There's, hell is filled with people who know Jesus died on the cross and rose again. Hell is filled with all kinds of people who believe the Bible. They just never asked Jesus to be their savior. They never humbled themselves to say, I too need your forgiveness and yours alone. And so will you respond to his call today? His call to rest, to sow, or surrender. Let's do it. Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you got to ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer 
that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me, that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And today, I come home. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple, as the Bible says, because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.